Well, hello, everybody. Um, back to back sessions. I'm delighted to see everyone here, and I'm also delighted to welcome Jane Teepy, Minister of State in the UK for Armed Forces and Veterans. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, although I should quickly say, because this keeps happening at conferences, I'm afraid I lost the veterans brief when uh, uh, the government changed last, so just the armed forces now. What are the veterans doing? <laughs> well, they, they have many other ministers. But, good, uh, anyway. good, excellent. Okay, but I'm sure you keep them very much in your, your thoughts. Yeah. So. Um, so just to say that this is on the record, uh, please tweet uh, hashtag CHLondon. Um, when you, we go into the Q&A, please raise your hand in the room and, of course, in the chat online. So, James, the world is in high flux. We have uh, Russia's illegal war against Ukraine. We have a lot of turmoil in the Pacific. We have climate change, and we have quite a large ongoing technical revolution. Um, the UK did an integrative review in 2021, looking at all of this, uh, casting the UK as a tech superpower, uh, thinking very much about the long-term future, resilience, state sustainability, and, and so on. And it integrated foreign policy, defense, security, development, all of the, the really big issues that the country faces. And then there was, with that as well, other papers, including the Defense Command paper. Um, and in 2023, then, we had a refresh, given everything that's going on, this whole approach needed a, a rethink and a refresh. And we're still waiting, of course, for the accompanying Defence Command paper. Um, we're hoping it's due soon. We're here in July. Maybe you can confirm or deny. Um, and, and I want to be honest with you. I think a lot of people find the Defence Command paper, just at least the last one, are just on the little bit of boring side, right? It's very nerdy. It's very techy. It's very sort of down to business. It's very defensey. Will this one be more exciting? No. <laughs> no, but I, don't, but I don't know that it should be, because, you know, just at first principles, the integrated review is the setting out of government, foreign security and defence policy. How each of the departments who contribute to that then articulate their role within that overarching national foreign security and defense policy is necessarily nerdy uh, because it is the detail of how we as a department will deliver. And to make matters even worse for you, uh, and I'm not doing a good job of selling it here as a piece of literature to read on your summer holidays, but defense command papers are at their most interesting when the focus is on a new tank and a new ship and a new type of plane and all those kind of totemic platform-based capabilities. But actually what we've seen from the last 18 months or so with the war in Ukraine is that it's the, the way that the whole of the enterprise fits together that really brings credibility to your force. If you don't have the industrial base, you cannot scale in times of conflict and you can't replenish in contact. If you don't have the science and the technology, you cannot outpace your adversary in the way that you are innovating in the battle space. And we're seeing in Ukraine that with some capabilities, there's a sort of 10-week burn time on a piece of science and tech before the other side have figured out what it does, worked out how to counter it, and then you're back with industry to keep going. So you've got to have that in place. You've got to be able to hold the right people in your force. Because if the demands of the battle space are ever more demanding technology, the battle is always going to be demanding of men and women who are going to sort of fix swords and close with the king's enemies. That is always going to require incredible courage and bravery. But now we need soldiers who can do that and deal with the technological complexity of the battle space, and that requires an investment in skills and lots of training. And then there is this reality that in previous uh, defense reviews, strategic reviews of foreign policy, there's always been a receding threat against which to put a down arrow. So you could say in the late 90s, state threats fading, 
let's reap the peace dividend. And at that point, the answer was contract armed forces altogether. And then in the early 2000s, the emergence of violent extremism, that became the focus. And that's not to say that we didn't carry on buying ships and planes. We, in Typhoon and Type 45 and the carriers, we very obviously did. But in the Army particularly, the Army's entire equipment program for a decade or more was based entirely around counterinsurgency. And then in the last couple of years, the reemergence of state threats as the pacing threat means that you can dial down on the counterinsurgency and dial up the state threat. And in the last command paper, the premise was that states probably wouldn't go to war with each other. So really, the capabilities that were of most urgent need of investment were those where states would compete below the threshold of full-on conflict. Now, the problem is, if you take that continuum over a 25-year period of time, what we've now got is that states are competing with each other below the threshold of conflict. And so those gray space capabilities in cyber, in capacity building, in the ways that you maintain influence and, you know, and, and reinforce multilateralism, to James's point earlier on, you still need all of that. There is still plenty of violent extremism in the world. Daesh and Al-Qaeda affiliates are growing in their influence in the territory uh, that they control, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And then in the last 18 months, we have seen that states do go to war with each other and that the, that the credibility of your conventional deterrence matters. But and my final point, uh, uh, by way of introduction, what was really interesting, being on the other side of the fence, watching for the signs that a state meant it, that they actually were about to go to war with each other, the things that we were looking out for weren't the brigades, weren't the squadrons, weren't the movements of ships. The things we were looking out for were the bridging assets. It was the logistics. It was the medical stocks. Those are the things that give credibility to a force. And because we've not really had to think properly about the threat of state-on-state -state war since the early 90s, those are the things that quietly have, dis you know, out of mind, no one really cares about them. Nobody splashes on the front page of the Telegraph about a reduction in medical stocks, but they will about the cut in the number of tanks. And actually, it's those things that nobody really cares about that we've got to urgently reinvest in to get back the credibility of our warfighting capability. Ben and I revel in the idea that this may be the most boring defense command paper <laughs> ever. But we also think that by having been in the department for four years straight, it gives us, it's given us the opportunity to look under all of the right stones and to actually see what it is that the UK needs to do to really bring credibility to our armed forces and therefore to our hard power. So, you're giving us a bit of a sneak peek into Quite what's coming. Quite a bit coming. of a sneak peek, actually. Let's go for a little bit more. <laughs> and and uh, where, where's the money going to be primarily invested? You mentioned logistics, you mentioned medical supplies. What else do you think should be prioritized? I know the issue of sustainable defense spending is really important. The issue of resilience has yeah. obviously, you know, ramped up quite a lot in the last refresh. How, how will you see this in terms of the long-term planning for the defense forces in the UK? Well, look, first things first, you know, it's a really important point that we're 13 years into government. So this isn't starting a new, a kind of fresh, you know, fresh go at it. Huge amounts of money has gone into defense over the last 13 years. Big increases in defense spending uh, under Prime Minister Johnson. Prime Minister Sunak has uh, put another couple of billion our way when no other department in Whitehall was getting more money. Uh, we're very grateful for that. And in the course of sort of 2015 to 2035, across land, sea, and air, the front line will be almost completely recapitalized. You know, new SSNs, uh, new, new nuclear bombers in build, Type 45s will have had their engine replacements done, new, two new classes of frigates, um, Typhoon will have had its systems upgraded, F-35 will have arrived, Protector will have arrived, A-400 will have arrived, P-8 will have arrived, D-7 will have arrived, Ajax, Challenger 3, Boxer. So across the front line, hundreds of billions of investment in recapitalizing the front line. So let's, let's just get that out there up front. But then beyond that, what we're seeing is big investment in our dockyard infrastructure, big investment in our technical workshops, investment in our people. We don't have anywhere near enough engineers 
to deal with the number of platforms and their complexity. So we will, you know, there are some, there are some hard capabilities that we have to invest in. A lot of that was signposted in the previous command paper. There's a lot of money going into stockpiles. That's already announced and quite explicitly the money that we got in the autumn was for stockpiles and nuclear and a couple of other things. And then beyond that, there is a, there is a, there is a decisions that always are in preference towards those things that just make the machine work, to, to upskilling our workforce and finding terms of employment. I commend to you, because it's already out and published, the Haythorn Thwaite Review, which is the first time since the 90s that someone has really looked at the whole package that we offer to our service people and considered the terms and conditions and service for soldiers, sailors, aviators. And Haythorn Thwaite is out, and it's a really genuinely good read that we are taking very seriously as, an, as the document to inform our people reforms. Uh, and you know, we just, that, that'll be, that'll be there, you, there, there won't be, there won't be big, da 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 da, da here's a new tank. Mm. But there will be, for those who really know what they're talking about as defense analysts, there'll be a lot of things that people will reflect have been too long coming. And I think that people will see what Ben and I and the Chiefs are trying to do in the paper that will be produced. And, and, and with, with this new approach and new package, what, what are you going to do about recruitment? Because, you know, certainly for the Army, there's a real, real problem with recruitment. Um, there's also a problem with reservists. You know, how are you, how are you going to get all of this kit, all of this new tech um, staffed and operational? Well, uh, that is the biggest challenge. Yeah. Like, I, I, and, you know, the people tends to be a sort of, you know, a, 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 you know the back pages of a, of, a, of a document. And yet every MOD, every, you know, literally all over the world, it's always the last of the penultimate chapter in the book, and yet it begins with our people are our most important asset. We might be rethinking the order of things uh, in, in the Defence Command paper. Um, because even in this, you know, every, the thing that everybody wants to talk about at the moment is automation and AI. But that doesn't replace the requirement for people. It just changes the requirement for people. Skill set. Exactly. And then there's, you know, Haythorn Thwaite has identified that the young people coming out of school and college and university at the moment seeking to embark on a career in the military are not looking for a 30 or 40 year continuous career. That's not what millennials or centennials seek to do in their career ambition. They kind of five to 10 years here, five to 10 years there. And that's an interesting tension because it's a tension between the idea of selfless commitment and sacrifice and duty that is there is no high honor to, higher honor to serve versus a more, well, I want to do a bit of that, a bit of that, a bit of that, which is more sort of about the individual. I think we have to recognize that what we're asking of people is whilst they are serving, they show selfless commitment and duty and patriotism, but enabling them to come and go within a continuum of military service from full-time across into the reserve. I think Haythorn Thwaite is really onto something in the recommendations that he is making. Because consider the counterfactual. I bump into, you know, pinch point trade at the moment, aircraft engineers. I will bump into Chinook engineers who will have spent the last seven or eight years on almost a four-month-on, four-month-off tour rotation between Gao in Mali, uh, Erbil in northern Iraq, and then four months back in, in, in the UK. On, off, on, off, on, off. And the demands on the Chinook force were such that even when they're in the UK, they're working hard, but you could never give them any respite because there simply weren't the people to go in behind them and let go as well. So you end up in a place where... They turn around to you and say, I'm desperate for a break. The system can't give them a break because there aren't any spare engineers. We need to recruit more engineers. And then the, force, the choice we force them into is just leave the service for good. They've gone. They'll never come back to us because that's the way that we conceive of military service. Whereas to be able to say to them, well, okay, yep, fair enough. Transition into the reserve or go and work with industry for a couple of years or go off and do something completely different. 
But when you're ready, come back to us. There's always a job for you with your skill set, and you'll be welcome back. And we can sort of figure out how that works in terms of seniority and whatever else. I think that's really invigorating. And I, I, I say again, I mean, I, this is no sneak preview of the command paper. This is just Haythornthwaite. And I, I suggest to you keenly that it's well worth reading. And what about investment in living conditions, which is so important uh, for the military? And, yeah, and also families, education, social support, all of those things which we know has sort of been a real problem over quite a long time now. So, I mean, it's important to... I, I think it'd be churlish to say there isn't a problem. There very obviously is, and it makes the headlines rightly whenever the standard falls short. But there is also an awful lot of very good standard defence housing out there. And I do think that, and I think Rick Haythornthwaite makes this point as well, that defence is really bad at articulating how valuable the whole package is when you put in the pension and the food and, you know, uh, and the accommodation and the opportunity for uh, education for your kids if your career moves you around. You know, there's a sort of, there's, you know, we, we remunerate our people across a range of benefits quite well don't really sell that as much as we should. But where we fall short, and on service family accommodation, it's very obvious that there are places in the estate that do fall short, some urgent investment is needed. And I'm not going to uh, preempt anything that may be in the command paper, but you know, we, we know that a barrier to attracting people with the right skills maybe a perception that somehow you end up having to live in a hovel. That's not the case. The vast majority of defence housing is of a really good standard, but we need to get a grip of the stuff that falls short. Now, I'm aware of the time. Now, we did start late, so I'm going to go late. Um, uh, so just uh, be aware. Um, I, I want to just ask you to address the issues of the rest of the world. So I think we're looking very much at the UK now. We're obviously thinking very much about what's going on uh, from Russia through to Ukraine and elsewhere. We've been talking a lot today as well about China. We've looked at issues to do with the Middle East with great powers. But what about some of the other issues? What about the Arctic, for example? Uh, what about space? What about the worry that everybody has about critical minerals, which is, are so necessary for this, the, the, the tech that we need? Um, the, the integrated review refresh and the integrated review address some of these. Um, how is it going to translate into the practicalities of defence? Well, all of that stuff is deeply interconnected. And I think that's quite interesting. You know, the sort of the, the hyper-acute state threats of Russia or Iran, the chronic competition with China, the, um, you know, th those all overlap and intermingle you know, there are parts of the world where we're all vying for influence, where the challenge is violent extremism or piracy. There are parts of the world, and in some cases, a, a malign state influence is part of that non-state threat. In others, they're just completely separate. They all just coexist. And so learning to navigate, to kind of practice defense policy in such a complicated geopolitical environment is, is quite challenging. You, you, the high north... On the one hand, our presence in the high north is simply to assert a freedom of navigation in accordance with the treaties of the, you know, the law of the sea. Um, but on the other hand, there is undoubtedly a competition over the high north because of what may be in, you know, un under the, the seabed in the high north. There's a competition over the high north because it could become uh, a sea route from the Far East to, to, to Europe that will be strategically very important. Um, you know, in in uh, East Africa, in the Great Lakes region, there is a violent extremism challenge that is long-standing, uh, and if anything, is becoming more complicated by the growth of IS, for example, in uh, in Tanzania and spreading. Um, but yet, on top of that, there is real competition between states for who has influence. And everybody, of course, has half an eye, just as oil and gas was the thing we competed over 150 years ago. Everybody has an eye on the need to compete over access to lithium, cobalt, copper, whatever else, um, in order to meet the needs of the economy of the future. So um, I just, you know, I, I say to staff colleges and stuff as I'm going around the place, this is, you know, it, it's never going to be quite as binary as kind of there's your enemy advance. And you know, there's always now going to be far more complicated geopolitics at the tactical, that play out at the tactical level. Um, I don't know that that means anything in terms of force design necessarily, 
but it goes back to the point about the sort of the nous of the people that are that are doing it. I'm going to go out now to the uh, to the floor. I'm, because of the time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to group uh, questions together. I've got some questions online as well. Um, if I could call on, on, on you as well, please, George. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm George Robertson, and I was the last British Secretary General of NATO. I just wanted to ask the, the minister about the comments made by uh, the Defence Secretary about the British uh, Armed Forces being hollowed out and underfunded, and indeed your own comments about uh, our armed forces being uncapitalized. We're in the short run-up to the uh, NATO summit at Vilnius. Are we going to be able to hold our heads high? Is the command paper refresh going to, in some ways, contradict what both you and Ben Wallace have said? Great. I'll take another couple of questions, uh, please. Um, over there, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm Julia. I'm a research analyst here at Chatham House. I wondered if I could ask about Russia's recent nuclear threats. And in light of these threats, do you believe that the current international non-proliferation framework is sufficient for this new security order? And if not, how can and how is the UK contributing to strengthening these norms, taboos, and frameworks? Thank you. And just to add in, Mark Alvin uh, online has asked about the, the nuclear arsenal as well, given the costs of maintaining capability contrasted with the cost of investment that you've mentioned, such as cyber, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll, I think that's three questions, and then I'll go out to the floor again and go okay. over. Thanks. Um, uh, so, my, my lord, um, I was reading some of the uh, Public Accounts Committee reports that were published during your time as Secretary of State, and I... Um, and, 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 the, and the actions that you took subsequently and, and, and your, your, your successors took uh, in appointing a chief, chief defense logistics and you, all the criticism that you reacted to, I think you did the right thing. You know, the challenge was that the post-Cold War, uh, that, that the armed forces maintained a kind of profligate approach to logistics and stockpiles, you know, lots of duplication, and that that was a really inefficient way of doing business, and there were huge savings, and so your, you and your successors got, I think, General Sir Kevin O'Donoghue to come in and try and rationalize the whole of defense logistics. Absolutely the right thing to do, and throughout the Iraq and Afghanistan is that just-in-time approach to logistics that just about every other major organization of our size uses was entirely the right approach. You, you know this, sir. You, you did the right thing to respond to the situation, the machine you had then. So I think when we say it's been hollowed out, we don't necessarily do so as a point of criticism. You know, the, the, the criticism leveled at you was that we were too fat and that it needed to sort of be rationalized and made more efficient. The problem is, is in the Cold War, we had all of that duplication for a reason because duplication brought resilience. And so when you return to an age of genuine state threat, you have to kind of regrow that resilience and effectively, therefore, reduplicate. So I, I think sometimes this kind of, you know, people try and use, it's such a sad reflection of modern politics that it's endlessly this whole kind of gotcha moment of, oh, well, the minister, well, yeah, but hollowing out the war fighting capability doesn't mean that defense wasn't optimized to deliver properly for the challenge that we faced in the 25 years in the meantime. The challenge that Ben and I face now is regrowing the credibility of that war fighting capability because right now the Public Accounts Committee have gone 180 degrees on what they wrote to you and they're saying that we don't have credible and resilient logistics. So we need to get a grip of that, but that's politics, I suspect. Um, on the nuclear uh, arsenal side, um, I mean, I, I, uh, I hate being in an audience at conference when someone sort of goes, oh, it's all a bit above my pay grade. I think that nuclear proliferation treaties are not a matter of defense policy. They're a matter of foreign policy, and they're a, they're a matter of very highly considered foreign policy. I would say that I think that we... Uh, that there are risks in the world of nuclear proliferation that there haven't been for a very many years, a very, uh, a very great many number of years. 
And if the nuclear taboo were broken, and please God, let it not be, the risks of countries taking matters into their own hands and acquiring nuclear weapons quickly would be, is obvious. You know, there are a whole list of countries that would, that would say, well, this is the moment to, to tool up. Whether that requires a reimagining of the non-proliferation architecture, I, I, I genuinely haven't given it enough thought to comment to a crowd of this intellect. Um, but I do think that it is something that governments who are in the nuclear club should be thinking very carefully about because it feels like uh, there is a risk of proliferation now that maybe hasn't been for a while. Um, and on stockpiles, I mean, look, again, I, I don't want to... Uh, I, I would get in a lot of trouble if this became a pre-announcement of the command paper, but there was an announcement in the previous command paper about our stockpile levels. I don't think we have seen anything uh, in the meantime to persuade us to change that announcement. Okay, that's a bit of a sneak peek, I think. Thank you. Um, okay, um, out to the floor again. Um, any other questions, please, over, over here. And then at the back there. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Zumarud from uh, Leadership Masterclass Programme at Chatham House. Perhaps I will enter this conversation from a different angle. I'm quite curious, because uh, we're talking about the world at the moment and generally about the politics from realist view. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts about demilitarization and feminist foreign policy, and generally how do you think that it's um, me as a dreamer speaking about this kind of world order, or do you actually think there is possibility for us to um, change and redesign uh, the whole narrative around it? Thank you. Before you answer that, um, at the back, please, um, in the blue, blue shot, thank you. Hi, um, you had a question about dual use technology. So um, in the context of the sort of US-China conflict, if we want to restrict China's ability to get high-end weapons, it's not just about restricting tanks, but also semiconductors. Uh, and at the extreme, I suppose that can be regarded by the Chinese as uh, restrictions on their sort of economic development. So uh, my question is really, is there an inevitability to that? And uh, you know, uh, difficulty in separating these two uses of semiconductors, or can we find a sort of sensible ground where we restrict the, the most impactful militarily but open up to other ones? Thank you. There's a question at the front. I shouldn't, I shouldn't uh, ignore people at the front. I'm often accused of that, sorry. Thank you. Um, how do you view the ongoing security escalations emerging from northern Kosovo? And do you believe the West is sleepwalking into another war in Europe? Thank you. And just to say that online, there are a lot of questions about um, man manpower, people power, and logistics and so on. But uh, one of them is also about um, cyberspace and cyber warfare and the need for more work establishing internationally recognized norms. And, and how to um, how to get the the, the sort of political uh, push behind those? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, to the, the first question, um, I, I mean, you, you, you said you're a dreamer. Uh, I fear that uh, the idea of a sort of demilitarized world is probably um, a bit fanciful. Uh, it just. Yeah, I, I, I mean, who would go first? Um, and I know that that is the great argument about nuclear weapons and unilateral disarmament, or whatever else, that someone has to kind of get the ball rolling. But I just, I just think in a world that is ever more unstable, insecure, and given that the first priority of any government is the security of its people, um, I think it's, it's, it's not an argument of the current time to make a case for demilitarization. And I... Um, I'm not sure I know what a more feminist foreign policy necessarily is. I will go away and educate myself. We'll hold a seminar I, in the OMD with you. Well, I would be interested yeah. to, to understand, but because if it, is as, if it is as simple as that there's a sort of, that a, that a world in which hard power is the way of getting business done is a sort of more masculine trait and that a more feminist trait is that everybody would talk, I, 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 that, I mean, that feels like quite a lazy stereotype, but I No, I, I don't think that's such at all. I think okay. feminists are pretty tough. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. I mean, I would like to, yeah. I'd, I'd like to understand what it was. I, I wish I could answer your question better, because I, 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 I don't really know what you mean by sort of feminist approach to international relations. 
um, on, uh, on dual use, uh, I think that uh, you're absolutely right that we have to be very, we've got to be very clear about where our strategic advantage comes from. Uh, and often our science and tech will be our strategic advantage. But the other part of that strategic advantage is our access to the materials with which you can, you can innovate. Uh, and uh, you, you asked me, I think, earlier on about sort of rare earths and the geopolitics around that. Semiconductors, similarly so. There is a, you know, I think that the things that make you, the things that make you sovereign in 20 or 30 years' time won't necessarily be oil, gas, and the ability to bend steel, as may have been the case uh, in the sort of 1940s. I think the things that make you sovereign in 20 or 30 years' time is your access to rare earths and semiconductors. Uh, and your ability to do very advanced manufacturing. Um, you, you mentioned within your question the sort of challenge of China. I mean, I, I think China has every right to pursue a foreign policy that secures the resources that it believes it needs to sustain its economy. The challenge is the rest of us have to have similarly ambitious foreign policies to make sure that we too are working to secure access to those things. Um, and it's not just the, the access to the, the mine, it's then the processing and everything else that, that follows. And we do have to be careful that through dual use technologies, we don't end up compromising our strategic advantage by not spotting that we're exporting something within which is very sensitive IP that gives us an edge. And, and we need to be better at mapping that out. Um, on northern Kosovo, I was there the other week uh, and... Um, I do think that you know, Kosovo is, one of the, is a great example of where the UK uh, and our allies have had a very patient and ultimately successful foreign policy in that this country has emerged and is succeeding. Um, and we do have to be very careful, very careful, that as we focus on Russia in Ukraine and ensuring that Putin fails there, that we don't take our eye off the Western Balkans where the geopolitical tensions are still very live. And both in Sarajevo and in Pristina, there was definitely a nervousness that the West, the EU, the Americans are taking their eye off, uh, off Kosovo, off Bosnia, off the Western Balkans more generally. Uh, and they're very nervous about that. So we, I don't know that we are sleepwalking into another war in Europe but I do think we have to keep it very firmly to the front of our mind. And then on cyber, I think there's a whole thing about how not just cyberspace, but space and other emerging global commons are governed. And interesting, this should be an area where, uh, where there is cooperation and collaboration with, with China, because China inescapably is an important pillar of, uh, of, the, of the world order. And with those with that position comes responsibility. And you know, working out how we govern cyberspace within the framework of a rules-based international order, working out how we go do space within the framework of a rules-based international order should be the thing that the big powers get around the table and work out. You know, that climate change is a whole series of things that you know, we compete with China where we need to compete. We hold to account where we need to hold to account. And when there are big decisions to make about the way the world is run, work with China to make those decisions in the global interest. James, thank you. I wish we had more time. Um, you didn't disappoint us. We are really looking forward now. Now that you've undersold the Defence Command paper, I think it's going to be much more interesting than you've let on. So thank you all uh, very much for your questions. Thank you for the number of questions online. Thank you, James. <laughs>